members of the Women and Development Studies Group, friends of the CGDS, colleagues, associate staff member of the CGDS, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, students, graduates and postgraduate students, a very warm welcome to all of you. I would like to begin by reading two congratulatory messages sent by email, which we received one today and one yesterday. And the first comes from Professor Maureen Kane, who some of you may remember or may not remember. Professor Maureen Kane was professor of sociology and one of the early members of the Women and Development Studies group. She was responsible for doing a survey in the 80s among staff and students about their need for childcare. And we had a whole proposal developed ab about childcare facilities on the campus. So we identified a house and everything. Of course, that didn't come through. And I also remember Professor Kane as allowing myself and Dr. Margaret Bernard uh, to come into her class and to talk about women in science and women in mathematics. So we, we were given three weeks of her course. And she's now at Cambridge in the UK, and she sent this to Rhoda. Dear Rhoda, many congratulations on the 15th anniversary of CGDS. In those years, you and the center have gone from strength to strength. I feel happy that I was there when the centers were first envisaged. Able now to share in your joy and acknowledge your great cause with pride. May the CGDS have many more successful years supporting women in the Caribbean through pro-women research and contributing more widely to feminist politics and feminist social science. Thank you on behalf of women everywhere, Maureen. And the second one comes from Els Mulder. Again, many of us remember Els from the Institute of Social Studies in The Hague, Netherlands. And um, she, she writes, their members of staff of CGDS and those invited to the CGDS 15th anniversary celebrations. I sincerely congratulate CGDS with its third lustrum and the achievements over the past 15 years. I proudly remember how UWI and the Institute of Social Studies in The Hague, the Netherlands, worked together for almost 10 years in the 80s and 90s in jointly developing CGDS academic programs and awareness programs for all segments of society. It was a challenging experience for all involved. It has been said before, but I repeat, that this project of academic cooperation has been an excellent, if not the most excellent and very successful example of academic cooperation in the history of the ISS and for the sponsor, the Netherlands Ministry of Development Cooperation. I also remember with pleasure and gratitude the successful continuation of activities in the years ahead of you. Thank you for the invitation to attend the celebrations. Unfortunately, I'm on the other side of the Atlantic. With my very best wishes and kind regards, Els Mulder. It was in September 1993 that the CGDS came into being as a multi and interdisciplinary center responsible for a program of teaching, research and publications and outreach in gender and development studies. With sister centers at Cavill and Mona and with a regional coordinating unit which ensured that we remain in sisterhood. This was located on the Mona campus. St. Augustine's CGDS was officially launched on December 12, 1995, at a very modest ceremony, presided then by the former principal, PVC Maxwell Richards, who is now president of the Republic of VNT, and who in his address at that ceremony stated of the center, its beginnings may be humble, but its role pivotal. And that simple ceremony held at Salisa's conference room the then Minister of Gender Affairs, Dr. Daphne Phillips, delivered the feature address. And I know Dr. Phillips would have wanted to be here this evening, but she has a class and probably will try to join us later. The celebration of the fifth anniversary, coming close on the heels of the launch of the center, was a very simple affair, but we were very proud to have the then Dr. Prof Patricia Mohammed, now Professor Patricia Mohammed. She was head of the Center of the Mona Group, and she came to St. Augustine to deliver the feature address <clears throat> for the fifth celebration, anniversary celebration. 
And then we had the 10th anniversary celebration in 2003, and this was a much more gala affair in the um, LRC. The then Dr. Pro Patricia Mohammed, now Professor Patricia Mohammed, she was head of the Center the Mona Group, and she came to St. Augustine to deliver the feature address <clears throat> for the fifth celebration, anniversary celebration. And then we had the 10th anniversary celebration in 2003, and this was a much more gala affair in the um, LRC auditorium. And we had a feature address given by PVC Elsa Leo Riney um, of the Mona campus, and we all know her, who was principal for the past year, um, and who was featured very prominently in the Mona 15th anniversary celebrations held two weeks ago. There was the ALR um, symposium talking about gender and education. She was here for our 10th anniversary, and of course at that celebration, awards were given out to those members of staff who supported the CGDS in their quest. We were hoping for this 15th anniversary celebration to have Cave Hill's input. However, the now deputy principal of the Mona campus and former head of the CGDS at Cave Hill, PVC professor Eudine Barito, however, had other duties and she sent her deepest apologies, but promised that she's going to be with us during the coming year, the rest of our 15th year celebration, to give us a public lecture. So we look forward to that. This program today is the first of the public activity marking the 15th anniversary of the center. And in doing so, we chose to go back and to feature two activities, which not only celebrate the 15 year milestone of the center, but which is going to recognize the pivotal role played by a group which became organized as far back as 1982, the Women and Development Studies Group. This group will be featured in the program today in two major activities. The first will be the launch of the Women and Development Studies collection, which is at the back, some snippets of it uh, displayed at the back. And this is being done in collaboration with the library and following that launch, which is going to be coordinated by Professor Patricia Mohammed, uh, we will then have a panel discussion of past Women and Development Studies group members, which will be coordinated by Deputy Principal Rhoda Redock, and in which we're going to be looking at, for the case of the students, the whole mix between activism and academia. So you'll be noticing that uh, the group was very, a very activist in nature, but we were also very academic in developing programs and having seminars and training and so on. I want to bid a very hearty welcome to the students. As you all are aware, today is the International Day of Violence Against Women, and both Dr. Hussain and Deborah McPhee have been working with the students, as well as Professor Papert and other members of staff, to coordinate the candlelight vigil, and many of you would have noticed, and if you haven't, um, after the ceremony, please look at their display of uh, women who have passed away by violent means. There's a little pamphlet they're handing out as well for you to read, and notice the T-shirts in black and white and the logos on it. And so we're very pleased that the students are participating in this activity, in this program, in these celebrations tonight, and very special welcome to them. My very great pleasure to bid you first a hearty welcome, and then to invite you to relax and enjoy the items and the program for this evening's celebrations. We're going to start with the launch of the Women and Development Studies Collection, and it's part of the Making of Caribbean Feminisms project, and I'm going to rely on Professor Patricia Mohammed to tell us a bit about that. Um, Professor Mohammed is no stranger to us. She's now the campus coordinator for graduate studies. She's professor of gender and cultural studies and a historian as well. Uh, so she's going to give us some perspective, perspective on the making of Caribbean feminisms. Good night, everybody. I am so um, very pleased to see all of us here, to see good old friends, <laughs> new friends, um, colleagues from 
way back when. And somehow getting here after that march was terribly inspiring. Literally took me back to the day when we would walk with placards all over. It is such a fitting start, I think, to this 15th anniversary. And perhaps one that I would like to think optimistically will pr propel us into the next 15 years with that kind of mix of activism. I'm very honored to have been asked by the CGS to speak about the formation of the project, the making of Caribbean feminism, and to um, assist in the launch. And I, I tended to have a slightly different idea of what, what I was doing here. So please forgive me if it travels through three parts, a, a presentation that travels through three parts. The first, um, the first is to honor Estella Scott, the second to launch the, the um, to actually present the, the, the background to the launch of the making of feminism. And the third is my own sense of looking back on time that I thought I would like to take this occasion to do, and you know, to do that frankly with you, and I think this is a nice audience to do that with. I join my colleagues in honoring all of those who have served the cause of gender equality and gender justice in myriad ways over the years. I begin this presentation, however, on a sad note and in recognition of the significance that this day carries in the feminist movement. On 11th October 2008, just over one month ago, a burnt-out black Ford Edge was found in the dikes in West Bay, Cayman Islands, with a body that was destroyed beyond immediate recognition. Forensic tests revealed that it was the remains of Estella Scott Roberts, a young and vibrant woman whom I had come to know and respect fully between 2000 and 2002, when Audrey Ingram Roberts and myself assisted the Cayman Islands with the writing of their national gender policy for equity. In the statement to the Cayman press, Audrey had this to say about Estella. Estella had just then returned to Grand Cayman, having completed her studies abroad, and took up the post of project coordinator. Whatever anxieties I had about her capability to, to replace the excellent project management provided by Marilyn Connolly was quickly replaced by respect, appreciation, and admiration. Estella was industrious, boundless in energy, and fearless in the face of any challenge. She loved to learn, and she balanced her competency and efficiency with tremendous emotional intelligence, which included her great capacity to laugh at life and self. So it was no surprise when Estella, who believed that you had to walk the walk rather than talk the talk, threw herself fully into setting up the crisis center, a safe place for abused women. She made this her compelling mission. Estella left the ministry to take up the position as the first executive director of the crisis center when it was open. During that time, she received many death threats, but was without fear in her work and remained a passionate and staunch advocate in the community, often raising questions and speaking on issues that many would have preferred to remain unspoken. That is the end of a quote from both Audrey and Marilyn. And this is my own take. Even as we have come to accept the inevitability of death by accident, old age or infirmity, a young life that is taken prematurely and at, and at its peak resounds with tragedy. Estella represents for us today all those whose lives have been lost through senseless violence. Death must remind us to renew our energies in the fight against all kinds of violations and thus reduce the pain that is visited on the, on the lives of those left to mourn. Estella, your stout heart, your loving, independent, and free spirit will remain with us always, but we keep you in our hearts and our minds. Thank you. I move now to the second um, part of my presentation. Today I have been entrusted with the task of outlining the background to the special open collection on feminism that is now hosted at the UWI St. Augustine Main Library. Before we acknowledge and thank those who have contributed to and made this collection possible, allow me to establish the beginnings and context. In 1999, as then head of the Mona Unit Center for Gender and Development Studies, Jamaica, I'd begun a series entitled Conversations with Gender and worked alongside the Women and Development Studies groups, group members who continued to teach courses with me in developing gender studies on that campus. One of the projects that I conceptualized with this group was entitled The Making of Caribbean Feminism. 
The title, as it shifted to incorporate a wider regional focus, was named The Making of Caribbean Feminisms. But I want to ponder briefly on the original idea, but I want to ponder briefly on the original idea and sentiment which gave rise to the project. And I think this is very important. I've been influenced by a seminal book, The Making of the English Working Class, an influential and pivotal work of English social history, written by E. P. Thompson, a notable left historian, new left historian. In this book, Thompson concentrates on English artisan and working class society in its formative years, 1780 to 1832. What interested me was Thompson's rationale for writing such a history, as he noted in his preface. I'm seeking to rescue the poor stockinger, the Luddite cropper, the obsolete handloom weaver, the utopian artisan, and even the deluded follower of Joanna Southcott from the enormous condescension of posterity. Thompson was critical of the history that turned people of the working class into an inhuman statistical block. He displays them as being in control of their own making and furthermore emphasize the need to capture parts of popular movements that are often forgotten in history, a history that is generally written by the privileged. Apart from capturing people's humanity, Thompson is also interested in the idea of a class consciousness that was being raised differently for different groups in the society, but nonetheless expanding with each new dimension of class struggle that was being waged on many fronts. The project of making of Caribbean feminism was similarly conceived as both an empirical gathering of facts, throwing out a wide net and collecting the many variations on a theme of feminism. In doing so, it was hoped that we would collectively bring together the data and stories that would continue to tell us how a feminist and gender consciousness was, gets formed. The project was viewed as both the vehicle through which data of all sorts would be gathered, as well as provide a means for analysis. The other two units were invited to join the project, and at first, a first joint meeting, which is dated here, was held in, ja in January 2002. And as you can see, um, these were some of the people gathered at that meeting. Cavill attended, but due to their own um, project, which was that of, of um, building the Dave Nita Barrow collection, could not fully participate and with limited staff. But St. Augustine, through its then head, Professor Rhoda Reddock, was more than happy to come on board with this project as it resonated with the kinds of interests in activism and analysis, theory and praxis that both Professor Reddock and I have understood as a basis of feminism. These slides just show two, two um, brief images of the meeting that was held in Trinidad in 2002. The project in St. Augustine obtained UWI Research Publications Awards, and this facilitated the development of the special collections for the UWI Library, the collection and transcription of bibliographies of feminists, and for some of this material to feed into the new organ that had also sprung up by 2005 for the Center for Gender and Development Studies, the Caribbean Review of Gender Studies, an open access online journal which carries a special section on material related specifically to feminist activism. One of the useful activities which was held under this project was the hosting of a one day, sorry, these were some of the goals, which, and you don't want to do all that reading now, so I'll quickly move on an intergenerational meeting of feminists by a young Fulbright Stuani O'Neill. A video exists of this meeting, and here are some of the photos of those who attended the meeting and participated. My primary task, however, is to acknowledge and officially launch the special collections housed at the UWI Library, which is related to and comes out directly from the making of Caribbean feminisms. The special collections contains all documents related to the Women and Development Studies groups, which I know you will hear more about later. Um, the, it includes unpublished papers, books, bibliographies, seminar reports. It also contains photographs and interviews with a number of Caribbean feminists. In launching this initiative, let us give thanks to those who have made it possible. 
Professor Redock for supporting the project of making the Caribbean feminism as head of the center, then head of the center. Camille Antoine for starting the process. Ms. Yulin Blondell for cataloging of documents. Ms. Lorraine Nero for guidance during the process, for, and Lorraine is from the library. Kathleen Helenis Paul, who has always facilitated the CGDS initiatives with the UWI Library, and if you saw, and Kathleen was there in our first meeting on the making of feminism. And Deborah McPhee for taking it to this stage and getting it to first base. Can we give them a big round of applause? Deborah and the CGDS reminds us too that this is merely the start and it is an open collection which means it can be added to and it can become the repository of any kind of memorabilia, photographs, papers, notebooks, invitations, ephemera of programs, pamphlets, one-off newsletters, etc. You name it. The CGDS will continue with the library in building its capacity and allowing another generation of feminists access to the thoughts and lives of those who predated them. If I am allowed just a few more minutes, I want to take this now because I think 15 years means that we also look ahead into to what I see as some of the what lies ahead in the future for us. I call this piece Making Peace with Our History. If in this presentation, as I, go, I, as I proceed now, I have sometimes taken a personal tone, this has been deliberate. I have been increasingly, over the years, disturbed by the animosities and criticisms directed at the Center for Gender and Development Studies. The recent Mona celebrations, which commemorated our 15th year, as well as recognized Professor Elsa Leoraini on the Jamaica campus, cast this into sharper relief and perhaps brought home to me again more personally how institutions and movements can inadvertently or otherwise marginalize and worst yet alienate individuals or groups who have much to offer still. Lip service over the years paying homage to the women and development studies groups whose list of coordinators I now see recognized in that um, brochure um, may not be necessarily recorded in our campus directories and histories and the sisterhood that was forged with practitioners who do not work within the university appears empty to many in the face of the contributions they have made as committed followers rather than in leadership positions. At the end of the conference, I thought that it was time that we confronted some home truths about ourselves if we had to move on. These undercurrents had now gained momentum and the overflow could drown us as well. Some tensions are good for growth, others can stifle. My concern, however, is broader than merely repairing the reputation of the CGS. Time and history will reveal its own salience, the instrumental role it has played as one of the key actors in the feminist movement of the latter 20th century, and how it may continue to do so in the 21st century in the region. The valuable role of feminism in the academy is still insufficiently recognized. For too many, the movement is defined as grounded in activism and divorced from education or research, while for many others, transformation requires a happy marriage between both. I date my direct involvement in the feminist movement from 1976. I mark that date as it was a time when I began to write the first women's studies thesis, to my knowledge, proposed in the Caribbean for my MS in sociology, and was entitled Women in, in Education, Women and Education in Trinidad, 1868 to 1962. There was then no women's studies or gender studies program in the English-speaking region. There were no women's studies groups. But in the public sphere, Stephanie Daly had published the laws as they pertain to the status of children and women in this country. Also in 1976, Diana Maher Wyatt was defending women's rights in public spaces, and Hazel Brown and others had started the Housewives Association of Trinidad and Tobago called HAT in 1975. In Jamaica, Sistrin had begun their work in street theater with the unemployed supported under the Manly regime by 1978. In coming to feminism, I was influenced by the ideas of freedom that flowed like a body of sparkling river water from the civil rights movement, the black power movement, left-wing politics in which I was involved, and perhaps most personally, by the flower power generation, where I saw a generation of young women in the US and Europe beginning to express the freedom of their bodies in song, performance, and speech. 
It was not, in my case, certainly primarily a rebellion against a confining East Indian ethnic culture. These, these are labels we impose on ourselves for convenience at times, or by which we are explained to others. The late 70s and early 80s was a supreme moment where we did feel that all women were sisters under the skin and that everything was possible and within our grasp. As a result of combined active, academic and activism, theory and praxis, a philosophy that has never been at odds in my own mind and hopefully in my practice, I continued involvement in activism in the leadership of the first second wave feminist group in, in this country with the Concerned Women for Progress until 1983, when this group folded. As a young researcher, I was one of the two UWI staff from Trinidad who was involved from 1979 in the Women in the Caribbean Project as the first coordinator of the rape, first rape crisis center in, in Trinidad from 1985, the director of the inaugural seminar that launched the Women in Development Studies Project in 1986, and from with suggestions that were taken up by the regional coordinator, Lucille Mathieu and Mayer, with whom I worked closely for several years, to producing with Kathy Shepard, the second edited reader for Gender and Development Studies in 1988. Perhaps it was the third. The first was done by Justin Messiah from the Women in the Caribbean Project. The second by Pat Ellis, working through WAND and Peggy, Peggy Antrobus. By 1993, after a period as regional course director of interdisciplinary seminars from 1987, and, a f and fortunate to get one of the two PhD scholarships available under the Dutch project of developing women development studies at UWI, and my colleague Joan Rollins was the second PhD scholar there. I completed a PhD and joined the campus at Mona as the first head of the parallel Mona unit of the CGDS. I rejoined the St. Augustine campus in 2002. Perhaps a making of peace with history is in the first instance a coming to terms of what as individuals we have each contributed or not in our lifetime. It is a personal journey we must all take and be accountable first to ourselves before we can be so to others. One of the fundamental positions held by feminists of the second wave movement was the desire to reshape the discourses of power that we had considered male stream, where power was vested in the individual or institution rather than constantly reinvested in the collective consciousness that fed the goals of the movement. Feminism sought to extend the narrow meanings applied to democracy and to find new ways of envisioning futures that respected the contributions of women at all levels. This is clearly a daunting task we set ourselves. And we know that knowledge and self-knowledge is a process that can be one step forward, two steps backward. I think the time has come for me to personally retrace those steps and to also tell the stories of those persons whom I know have been part of that history of feminism in Trinidad and in the region. People like Pat Bino, whom many do not know, but who had just come back into Trinidad in 1977 from New York, invigorated by socialist politics and who was one of the chief architects of the CWP. Biographies of movements can serve a far more important function than that of personal reminiscences if they allow a range of positions and voices to emerge. I suggest that one of the ways forward for us, another generation of feminists who are now aging and moving on, is to capture our memories and those around us before we lo lose that history that is both personal and political. Last year, we lost one of our colleagues at Mona, and I'm more convinced that we need to do this now. I use this occasion of the 15th anniversary of the CGDS and my 32nd year that dates my active participation in feminism in the Caribbean and elsewhere to commit myself to promise to write this biography of the movement seen through my eyes, the unexpurgated version. <laughs> but its primary interest and intent is to recognize the different agencies of those who made this history possible. Like E.P. Thompson, I believe that what we are after in the long run is to understand the development of a consciousness, in my case, the growth of a feminist consciousness that was never limited to the academy, even if we have taken up some of the most public profiles in this struggle. Institutional histories cannot capture the material of the idiosyncratic or the individual, and all of this richness runs the risk of being forgotten, along with the men and women who were players in that movement. I do not write such a history to close the ranks and to venerate my own rule, role. I do this also to open the doors to others to empower younger feminists who might otherwise feel disenfranchised, the many who will never lead 
but will be faithful followers. I do it to ensure that younger feminists have data from which they can frame questions of what we have done and be able to ask these openly, without rancor, and with the freedom to intelligently critique. Making peace with history is not about writing oneself into existence, but writing about the passions that have led individuals to spend their lives struggling for a cause, about ideas that have shaped the world, and which may continue to do so. And if we are honest enough to confront the limitations of these ideas and the practices, and the need to reinvent them differently when they no longer appear to serve the cause of many, we may have a future. I want to end with the, as many of you who know me, I write with image more and more, and the history that I promised to write will be illustrated. And I want to end this presentation with some of those images, just a, um, a few that I have selected, and I, I will simply go through them, and perhaps some of you may put names and faces to them. If anyone is interested, that is um, Carol Gobin, Judge Carol Gobin in the middle. <laughs> and Josephine Milne, who was there on the campus, if anybody remembers her. And I won't tell you, that skinny woman is on the right. <laughs> this is in 1983, and you'd see Honor Ford Smith at the bottom there. Um, <laughs> For those of you who don't know, this is Els Mulder on the left and Lucille Matthew and me on the right. And for those of you who don't know, this is um, Gayatri Pargas, who was the, first, the admin <coughs> assistant on the first inaugural seminar. <laughs> And some of these are recognizable, but, the, um, but you would see Nesta Patrick, who's always been part of, you know, our centering the Caribbean. I, I move to some more contemporary ones now. Feminism Workshop Barbados. Masculinity Network, that we, where we ventured into years of masculinity with Ineka Cunningham and, um, what is his name, Antonio. <laughs> um, from Puerto Rico. And then I want in this history to embrace the, the young, the new, the people who have been part of those, um, the building of other traditions, the more contemporary one. Like the, these were the young people we got together from the national gender policy, being to, to frame that national gender policy going all around the country. <laughs> Graduate students of our um, 10th anniversary. And some of you would remember the 10th anniversary. I thought it was nice at this 15th anniversary to at least bring that one back on board. Um, our students, I think they need to be part of this history very much, what they have <laughs> built, what they have done. I wasn't sure which date it was. <laughs> Dorothy Roberts at the front of who, um, people who have been part of, you know, visiting, certainly, and, and again with the students, because I think whatever we do, um, it is about transferring that to another generation, so I end with them. Thank you very much, and thank you for allowing me to to launch my own. This is the handing over of the Women in Development Studies group collection to the library. We now have the agreement being signed by the two heads. Let me reiterate, the, it is an open collection. So we welcome contributions, pictures, we have members of the WDSG here, so we look forward to having you contribute 
those things in your house that you may throw away this Christmas. <laughs> so think about it. Yes, because you have to keep. Were you on. signing the gift agreement? This is the gift agreement. Right. So it's with two copies. Yeah. Sign two copies. Two copies, please. One for us oh, at the CGDS, and the other for the main library. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> and thanks to Professor Mohammed, who took us through way back in history. I'm sure we all appreciated and enjoyed that. And of course, it reminded me of the treat she gave us at Mona, where she did a film on Professor Elsa Leoraini, who was very well received and very much enjoyed by all. So thanks a lot, Pat, for keeping us together and transferring the information and the activism from one generation to the next. Um, this is part of our 15th anniversary, I think, the handing over in some ways.